It's always game day in Cleveland, as that big voice just told you. We are back for another season. Uh, we are beyond West Virginia. We are beyond the Hall of Fame game. And now we go into week one, truthfully, because they call the Hall of Fame game week zero, so we'll call this week one. And we've got a little, I don't know, hors d'oeuvres on the side is what we'll call them because of the Johnny Manziel story that is out there now on Netflix, which uh, was eye-opening and not really eye-opening. Again, he's Daryl Ryder. I'm Andy Baskin. Daryl, uh, let's start with Johnny Manziel. Let's just go right for the good yeah. stuff. I, after watch, I, I still can't believe that this all happened back. You know, this goes back to, uh, what was it, 2014 when the Browns drafted him. And here's the thing. Like, he wasn't even the biggest bust in that draft for the Browns. It was Justin Gilbert. Like, <laughs> Justin Gilbert was a bigger bust than Johnny was. But, yeah, I mean, I, I got to tell you, Andy, none of it was surprising uh, as far as, like, what was revealed in there. But, you know, the combine, his agent, Eric Burkhart, telling the story about, you know, him just crushing fluids to dilute whatever he did leading up to the combine out of his system. The fact that they were going to fake putting his dad in a hospital so he could have a reason to get out of Indianapolis to – visit you know like unbelievable um but yeah it, even more so unbelievable the browns drafted him traded up to draft him and they screwed over brian hoyer to put him on the field after he watched zero zero minutes of film to prepare for anything <clears throat> like it, it's just the incompetence surrounding that whole situation when you talk about the Browns to this day remains staggering. And even though like the Browns angle really wasn't played up very much in there, I would have loved to hear from Ray Farmer. I would have loved to hear from Mike Pettin or Kyle Shanahan who couldn't get the hell out of here fast enough uh, after that season. I would can't blame them after watching this again. It can't blame yeah. them. Yeah. But I would have loved to hear from those, those people that were intimately involved in the Browns decision-making process. Right. Right. Uh, but yeah, the, it, as far as revelations go, um, really to me, the only revelation that came out of that, aside from the, the stuff that like led, you know, led up to the combine, right. That, right. that I did not realize all that, but um, the, the fact that he talked about putting a gun in his mouth and pulling the trigger and, by God's grace, he's still with us. The the gun did not go off. Um, and, and I think that with the Johnny story, you have you, you have to separate the two. You have to separate the human being from the failed professional. And I think that it's okay to still be frustrated, disappointed, angry, however you want to phrase it, right? With Johnny Manziel, the professional football player, and the opportunity that he completely blew with the Cleveland Browns while at the same time having sympathy, empathy, however you want to describe that for him as a human being dealing with the demons that he dealt with the, you know, the, the, the suicide attempt and things like that. I think you can have compassion for him at the same time. So I agree with everything you just said. I agree with it. Look, I, I mean, I don't, there's no ill will. I think that he and Justin Gilbert were the worst draft in the history of the Browns organization. I think that he was a major mistake for the Browns to take. Although at the time I was along with everybody else. And I had said when they drafted him, he was someone that made our franchise relevant. And he did. He did. He put the Browns on the map and he never had to take a snap about that. And I think, especially watching the beginning of the documentary where it was really all about Texas A&M and what he was able to accomplish in college. It also reminded me that sometimes football, there, there are two things that it reminded me of. One, football might be an overcoach game when you look at Cliff Klingsbury just said, go play. It didn't sound like there was much of a playbook there. It didn't sound like there was much discipline there. It sounded like they said to this kid, here's the ball. We're going to say run, pass, and you do what you want. And it took them all the way to winning a Heisman. So I think sometimes when we look at this game, we may overthink it. That was the, one of the things that I got in the beginning of it. The other thing is that Johnny Manziel is the epitome of what we all fear when you give a 19, 20-year-old too much money. 
and you thrust them into adulthood when they're not really there and they make incredibly bad decisions. And as he explained his lifestyle and where he was going and the rock stars he was meeting and the places he was going and the ability to take money for signing autographs when you weren't allowed to, he still did it anyway and got the cash for it. So he didn't pay tax on it. Right. Um, you can't, you can't dismiss what goes through the mind of a, a unbelievably talented athlete who has money in their hands and has power. And so I get it. Like, I understand how this went down the path that it did. The biggest part was, was the, of the transition to the Browns was as you watched every team bypass him in that first round, they all knew it, but yet the Browns didn't. And that I think is the most bothersome thing that I got. <clears throat> I, I still need to watch the end of it, but you know, three quarters of it. And I still can't believe the Browns drafted him. And we all knew this yeah. and they knew it too. And they thought they could change the world. And man, I felt bad for Mike Pettin. I'll tell you that. Yeah. Uh, and, and Brian Hoyer. Yeah. And really? And Brian Hoyer. the offensive lineman that he had that had 35 Pro Bowl or All Pro mentions. Ridiculous. Yeah, it uh, I, that whole year seems surreal, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the, the fact that they s essentially scuttle the season to sell jerseys in the team shop. Let, let's be honest about it. That, Brian that, Hoyer said that on our show last yeah. week. Yeah, I mean that's that's what they did, um, and that's why Kyle Shanahan left. Not going to invest your time and energy in somebody that wasn't prepared to be a professional. And again, you can you you have to separate the human being from the professional. Johnny Manziel, the human being, my heart goes out to him. I hope that he has found peace and love and happiness in his life, and that he is able to be a healthy, happy human being for the remainder of his time on Earth. But at the same time, on the flip side of that coin, the professional, I have no sympathy for him. He screwed up royally. He blew a golden opportunity, um, put no effort into it. Um, the, the fact that, you know, it was real, revealed in the documentary said, I knew almost instantaneously I was going to be unhappy in Cleveland. And the reason why he was going to be unhappy in Cleveland was because he was going to have to work. Let, let's be honest about it, right? He was being held accountable. Right. They were trying to hold and him he, accountable. And, and I think that this is a cautionary tale, too, for a lot of parents and a lot of coaches when you're dealing with young, talented athletes, right? Because let's be honest about it, when you're dealing with young, talented men and women at, at, from an athletic standpoint, they're put on the pedestal, right? They're, they're winning the awards and the trophies and championships and things like that. And I, I think that there's a reluctance to really uh, coach and discipline those, th th those young men and women. And I think that Johnny Manziel is a cautionary tale of what happens when you do not do that, when you do not set boundaries, when you do not set expectations, when you do not, uh, you know, put them in their place when they need to be put in their place, when you do not coach them hard, right? And I think that that's a big root cause of what led Johnny Manziel down the path that he went down. There was no accountability. He could do whatever he wanted. He knew he could do whatever he wanted. Now, I'm a thousand percent in his corner when he talked about, hey, you know, I'm looking around this stadium and I'm seeing all I'm seeing my jersey going off the shelves like hotcakes in the in the in the school uh, bookstore or team shop or whatever. I ain't seeing any of that money. And I, I, I totally agree with him. He's a hundred percent right to have a complaint with that. Um, but at the same time, you do have to follow rules. And he was somebody that was unwilling, uh, you know, to, to, to follow rules. And, and you know, he, the, the folks around him, I think, enabled him to a degree. Uh, his agent enabled him for a while, especially, you know, because his agent, Eric Burkhart, was taught, my job is to get him drafted in the first round. And so I got to do whatever I got to do to get my guy drafted. So whether that means I got to help him mask drug tests or get him out of the combine and come up with some Fukakta story about my uh, uh, dad is in the hospital or whatever, just to prevent teams from being able to investigate further. 
and, and then the other part of it is, is like Johnny's issues off the field were not a well kept <laughs> secret. They were well known. And, and the fact that the Browns were willing to turn a blind eye, but as I said earlier, the sad thing is, or as messed up as that 2014 draft was, he wasn't even the biggest bust. It was the corner they took at the top 10, Justin Gilbert. He was the bust. That guy couldn't set an alarm clock to save his life. You know what I'm saying? Like, so um, yeah, it's it 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 was um it was a good documentary. It wasn't great because again, I don't feel like it was deep enough. I don't think it was expansive enough, especially on the on the the Browns angle. And they well, hold that thought, then, Daryl. I want you to tell me when we come back what they missed and what should have been said in that piece that wasn't. It's always game day in Cleveland. 